Good morning, Matt. Hey, good morning, Steph. How you doing? I'm well. How are you doing today? I'm well. Hi, Cynthia. Wait, Cynthia, can we can you hear us? Hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sometimes when I plug in the webcam, it doesn't plug in right or something. So the sound doesn't come on right away. No, it looks great. And it sounds great too. Okay, good. Um, all right. First things first, let's try for each of you to All right, I think we're, I think we'll get started here as we, there still might be some people who will file in, um, but they'll, they'll join us as they get here. All right, everyone. Hello, my name is Matt Klasky and I am the manager of public programs here at the Michener Art Museum. I'm really excited to welcome you to our event today. It's the first one in this collaborative project with our uh, colleagues at Del Valle University and the Michener Art Museum. Uh, before we get started, I have a couple of quick announcements and then we'll get right to our program. First, I wanted to go over a few features of our Zoom room <laughs> that we're in today. Uh, for the most part, I'm going to keep everyone muted to keep uh, the noise down. Uh, if you want to also mute your camera, you can do that by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will be recording today's event, so if you'd prefer not to be seen, please mute your camera now. Uh, you also have the ability to mute your microphone yourself if for some reason you become unmuted. That icon is also down there at the bottom of your, your screen. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't interact with each other. Also at the bottom of your screen, you should see a uh, chat button. If you click that chat button, a uh, window on the side of your screen will pop up. There you can chat with other, pan other participants and the panelists that we'll be hearing from today. If you have questions during today's event, we will be hearing uh, on a presentation that's more science-based. So if you have questions that about terminology or vocabulary or ideas that you just aren't picking up, please feel free to put those in the chat. I'll read them and I'll pause and I'll break in with uh, Cynthia, our presenter today. And she can explain some of those concepts if we, uh, if we need them to go through the, the program. Otherwise, if you have general questions, you can put those in the chat as well. I'll collect them all so that at the end of the program, when we've heard from both of our presenters, uh, we can have a more general conversation. So feel free to use that chat to talk with each other, put in questions, whatever you feel necessary to engage with each other and the panelists. Last tech, uh, point here. We, this is technology, and if we do experience a disconnection or a freeze, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you do, if we do experience one of those, we'll get going right away. Uh, so just hold tight and we'll get the program back started. Okay. Next, uh, we know now more than ever, the museum and the arts are a window into a wider world. And all of us at the Michener are thrilled to have your support by joining us today. If you like what you see and you're able to do so, I encourage you to make a donation to our annual fund today. Uh, every contribution, big or small, uh, makes a huge difference in our ability to present programming just like this uh, as we stay socially distant together. You can make that contribution through our annual fund through this link, which I'm going to post in our chat now. Uh, next, I want to remind everyone that the Mitchell Museum and the Museum Shop is open for visits. Our staff have been working tirelessly to prioritize your safety and comfort to create an intimate art viewing experience. We have some tremendous shows up right now and we would love to see you all in person. Uh, to register for your time tickets and learn more about how we are keeping you safe, visit our website, which I'm going to put that link in the chat right now. Uh, next, I want to let you know about an exciting virtual program that we have coming up on Thursday, October 8th at 2 p.m. It's 
collection connections, the Michener Art Museum and the Florence Griswold Museum. Uh, this is where we're collaborating with the Florence Griswold Museum in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, if you're a fan of our Art of Stillness or Docent Choice programs, this one is definitely for you. We've teamed up with the Florence Griswold Museum. They're gonna, some of their docents are gonna present on some of their favorite works in the museum. Our, some of our docents will present on some of our works in the museum. And at the end, we're gonna have a big conversation. Uh, this is a, gonna be a great virtual event, two museums, one event. Uh, it should be really, really fun to check out. That again is Thursday, October 8th. That's next Thursday at 2 p.m. You can register for that event through the link here. Uh, next, thank you. Most importantly, thank you, yes you, for being here today. Uh, your support right now helps put Michener into the future and provide dynamic and thought-provoking programs just like this. Uh, I also want to give a special shout out to the members of the Mitch Museum whose support keeps our light on and our community vibrant. Excuse me. I also want to thank our partners at Del Valle University for collaborating with us on this event and the future iterations that we're hosting uh, later in the fall. Whew. Okay, now I've almost done speaking, but I want to introduce both of our presenters today. First, I'd like to introduce our museum docent, uh, Steph Hilaka. After multiple careers as a minister, therapist, and consultant, in 1999, Steph decided to recast himself as an artist. He has studied with artists Nico Coachelli, Anne Packard, and the Irish painter Tim Hoxor. For 21 years, he has painted in various media, watercolor, pen, ink, oil, charcoal, figurative work, and mixed media. Art is his passion. He has led art tours nationally and internationally. As a docent here at the Michener Art Museum, he is well known for his art of stillness experiences. And since the COVID outbreak, he and his colleagues at the museum have led weekly uh, virtual tours, which I'm sure some of you are fans of and are very familiar with. Uh, this fall, he'll be teaching art online for children who are unable to go to school. Welcome, Steph. Thank you. Hello. Next, I wanna introduce uh, Cynthia Keller. Cynthia Keller graduated from Delaware Valley College in 1984 and earned a PhD in microbiology from the University of Pennsylvania in 1990. Keller has been a professor at Delaware University since 2004, where she teaches microbiology, virology, and, my and molecular biology <laughs> with a research focus on plant growth and promoting bacteria. Before landing at Delaware, Keller worked at Smith Klein Beacom and the USDA. Everyone join me in welcoming Cynthia. Welcome, Cynthia. Are you there? I'm here. Hello. Hello. I forgot I could talk. <laughs> well, you're going to get a lot more practice now because okay. <laughs> I would like to turn it over to you uh, for the first part of our program. Okay, can everybody see the PowerPoint slide? Good? Okay, so um, before we talk about microorganisms and climate change, I just wanted to remind everybody that um, bacteria can be beautiful as evident by this portrait of me using agar art, which was made all with bacteria that produce different um, pigments. Right, and so I've incorporated these throughout my talk so you can have something artistic to look at to have to do with bacteria. Um, so there's not a lot that we know about microorganisms and climate change because it's not um, widely studied. So there was a call that came out last year and this reference is down here, right, that we need more information about microorganisms and climate change and what the effects might be to important microorganisms that we rely on or what might be some detrimental effects that microorganisms um, can do. So we just don't need, we just don't know enough and we don't know how uh, microorganisms are going to respond to climate change, how they'll adapt or whether they will adapt and survive. Okay. And this is important because, whoops. Okay, um, the, 
the theme is water, I think. So I tried to have most of my information about water, but we do have to talk about terrestrial environments a little bit. But microorganisms make up 90% of the biomass in the ocean. Um, and if we look at the number of different bacteria and archaea in both aquatic and terrestrial environments, it's about 10 to the 30th. So there's, I don't even know what the, that number is, but there's zillions and zillions of bacteria um, and archaea out there, right? And these microorganisms are responsible for half of all the carbon fixation and oxygen production on the planet, despite being only 1% of the global plant mass. So we cannot forget about these organisms. They are really important. They sustain our life. We can think of microorganisms as a life support system of Earth, right? We could get rid of all the humans and animals and the bacteria would be happily living along. If we got rid of all the bacteria, nothing would be able to survive, right? They're the first cells that evolved and they have been um, contributing to life on Earth ever since their evolution. Right? They're involved in nutrient cycling in various ecosystems. They cycle carbon, they cycle nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. And these are all nutrients that we all need to grow and survive, right? Um, they're important for animal health and they're important for plant health. I study plant growth promoting bacteria, but these are like your gut bacteria that influence your health and are important for your health, right? So we really can't um, forget about them. So I'm speaking for the bacteria today, right? And so first, I'm just going to cover some basic metabolism. So some of the terms are familiar to you. And then I'm going to give examples of greenhouse gases that microorganisms produce, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide during their regular metabolism. But there are some bacteria that utilize these compounds too. So we could put them to work for us, right? And then if there's time at the end, I'm going to talk about some other impacts of climate change on microorganisms and how that might affect our health, right? Like disease spread and things like that. Okay. So unlike animals or plants, bacteria are metabolically diverse. There are all kinds of bacteria and they can grow in all kinds of environments, right? So they can grow in the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. They can grow in deep, deep sea thermal vents. They can grow in the gut of animals. They can grow in the soil. They can grow in aquatic systems. But in order to do that, they need different types of metabolisms that's gonna let them survive in those particular environments. So this, these are some terms that we'll talk about when I'm talking about the bacteria. An autotrophic bacteria, right, has to get carbon in order to go, grow because we're all carbon-based life forms. Um, so they use CO2 or they can use methane gas as a carbon source. So these type of bacteria are going to be important in climate change because they're going to be a sink. We can sequester greenhouse bacteria. Uh, gases using these microorganisms. Some bacteria are lithotrophic, which means they use inorganic compounds to generate energy. So if you've ever been caving or spelunking and you see bacteria growing on the walls of the caves, there's no organic matter there for them really. So they use inorganic matter. So bacteria can survive in really adverse environments where life normally, we wouldn't normally find life. Bacteria can be photosynthetic, right? Just like plants, so they use light energy. And some bacteria are what we call methanogens where they convert CO2 into methane, right? So these guys aren't that great, right? Because we don't want to produce more greenhouse gases. And bacteria, depending on where they live, that environment, they're going to be sensitive to the concentration of oxygen. So some are some bacteria are aerobic, they grow in our normal air environment, but some bacteria are anaerobic, so they can't grow where there's any oxygen. Um, bacteria have different temperature requirements, so some bacteria like to grow where it's cold, so these would be in the Arctic ice shelf, where some bacteria like to grow where it's really hot, so these would be in the thermal springs or the deep sea thermal vents. 
And bacteria are also sensitive to pH. So some bacteria like to live where, some bacteria actually live where it's pH zero and some like a neutral pH. Um, so we need to take these things into, constant, in, into consideration because if we're gonna change the climate and the environment, then we're changing the environment where the bacteria are gonna live. And if we change the bacteria that live there, we don't know what consequences are gonna happen, right? Um, so I'm just gonna, we're gonna look at examples of bacteria and, and their greenhouse contributions and the ability to use greenhouse gases. All right, so this just shows the carbon cycle and it shows you for aquatic systems and um, terrestrial systems. But basically carbon dioxide can be sequestered by photosynthesis by microorganisms that they're primary producers, right? They make up 90% of the biomass in the ocean. So most of the carbon dioxide is gonna be sequestered by these microorganisms. Not shown in this picture, but also we have the um, chemolithoautotrophs that grow in the deeper oceans where there's no light and they can sequester carbon dioxide also because they have to get carbon from the carbon dioxide, okay? So what happens is primary producers then end up dying and falling to the ocean floor. Over lots of time, they become fossil fuels, but other bacteria that um, need organic compounds to get their carbon, they're gonna use that and through the process of respiration, they're gonna produce carbon dioxide. So they're gonna release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, Basically, the same cycle is going to happen in a terrestrial environment where plants are the primary producers and then the decaying matter is going to be to um, decompose by microorganisms and they're going to respire CO2 or depending on the environment, they're going to release methane gas. So they're going to undergo methanogenesis. Um, So if we look at um, carbon dioxide in aquatic environments, right, um, microorganisms, again, fix the CO2 using photosynthesis and chemolithoautotrophy, and they form the basis of the food web, right? They're going to be the primary producers. Increased CO2 levels can lead to increased primary production as long as other nutrients are present, right? So you might think this is really good. Um, however, if we get increased CO2 levels, then this leads to acidification of marine waters, right? And so we're gonna drop the pH of the water. The dropping the pH leads to coral bleaching and death of the microorganisms that are associated with the coral. Just like we have beneficial bacteria, coral also have beneficial bacteria that live with them and help them um, um, survive, right? And so if we're decreasing the pH of the ocean, then we don't know what's gonna to happen to these bacteria that are there that we rely on to produce oxygen and sequester carbon dioxide and things like that. One of the harmful things that can happen, and I'll show you on the next slide, is in response to these conditions, we can get harmful algal blooms, okay? So I know this slide is really busy, but um, this is a lot of examples of harmful algal blooms. But one of the harmful blooms is caused by microcystis, which is a cyanobacterium that's found in lakes and reservoirs. This organism produces um, mycocytins, which are toxic to animals and birds, mammals. Um, they're hepatotoxins, so they affect your liver. They're neurotoxins, they affect your nervous system and they're dermatotoxins, so they can affect your skin, right? And the number of these harmful algal blooms has increased in the last decade, right? Because these cyanobacteria can grow at higher temperatures where other bacteria might not like to grow or other microorganisms might not like to grow, right? They can sequester all, they can use all the carbon dioxide, they're photosynthetic. So they outcompete all the other aquatic organisms and cause this bloom. So these examples here, this is just a um, aerial view of Lake Erie 
and you can see all the green is this harmful algal bloom covering a large part of Lake Erie. This um, just came out in the Guardian. Um, and this is an example where a harmful algal bloom got into the watering holes of elephants and about 350 elephants, and these are all the dead elephants died drinking this water, right? This is a harmful algal bloom in a pond where you see the dead turtles, right? And this is the reference for that. And then just in preparation for this talk, I just got three headlines from newspapers in the United States. And you can see that there's harmful algal blooms across the United States due to increased global warming. So um, this can be a serious problem. So we, we do know in this case that raising the temperature of the water causes these harmful blooms and more CO2 in the atmosphere. Whoops. Um, this was an article, so it's hard to study ocean environments, but this was an article that just came out in the journal Science in August. Um, and what they did was they set up a 1,800 liter mesocosm. So they made their own little environment, but a large environment, and they stocked it with primary producers, bacteria and other microorganisms and coral and uh, algae that are photosynthetic. Primary producers that are gonna eat, our primary consumers are gonna eat the primary producers and then secondary consumers. And what they did over a four and a half month period is they increased the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere to stimulate acidification of the ocean water. And they warmed the temperature um, by 2.8 degrees Celsius to see what would happen. And so then they measured the primary productivity and the biomass of the organisms at the end of this time. And so right here on the left, right, this is the present condition. So you all should have in your tropic structure more primary producers and then primary consumers and less secondary consumers, right, to sustain an ecosystem. So what they found was that by doing this, they decreased the number of primary producers, right? By decreasing the number of primary producers, you had less food for the primary consumers. However, you had more room for secondary consumers, and I guess they, they didn't decrease that much. But this is not a stable trophic structure. So what they were saying is going to happen, would there be a collapse in the secondary consumers and the primary consumers, and there's just going to be primary producers. So essentially, um, by affecting our oceans, we're going to affect our food chain if we're going to get rid of all the fish that we like to eat because there's not there's not enough um, other food in the right trophic levels. Okay. And so just briefly in terrestrial environments, um, microorganisms are important for controlling the amount of carbon um, that's released into the atmosphere and the carbon that's stored in the soil, right? Um, currently, microorganisms store about one fourth of all carbon emissions. And so they're not capable of storing all the carbon. Um, so an increased carbon leads to more primary production. So we get more plant growth, but then we get more plants dying. So we get more litter, which leads to more decomposition, which leads to more CO2 in the atmosphere, right? Um, so increased temperatures is expected to accelerate CO2 release, right? Um, and a, not a great example is the permafrost. Well, I mean, it's a good example, but something that's not good is the permafrost, which is really a carbon sink. But if we're going to melt the permafrost and then we're going to make more carbon available for respiring or organisms and methanogens, right? Because these are anaerobic environments we're going to release more CO2 and more methane into the um, environment. Oops. Now I'm probably running out of time, right? So methanogens, just so quick about methanogens, right? Um, ruminant animals are the single largest source of methanogens, right? So they can contribute significantly to global warming. Um, 
Methanogens also live in aquatic environments, wetlands, and the intestinal tract. You could have a methanogen in your um, gut. But cows belch 200 to 400 liters of uh, methane a day, which is a lot, right? Um, so I guess we could think about decreasing our cow usage, right? Um, one thing that we can do that, that benefits us using these methanogens, right, is have anaerobic sledge digesters or landfill capture, where we actually capture that methane gas and then we use it as a fuel source. Um, so that's one way that they're beneficial for us. So the next uh, um, is the nitrogen cycle, right? And so in the interest of time, I'm gonna briefly here, but bacteria are really important in the nitrogen cycle. The blue lines here, these are processes that are only done by bacteria in the soil. So bacteria can fix nitrogen into forms that plants can use. Um, they can take that ammonia, ammonium and nitrify it, um, but then they, certain bacteria undergo this process that's called denitrification. And what the denitrification does is produce nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a really bad greenhouse gas. One pound of nitric oxide released into the atmosphere warms the atmosphere 300 times more than the same amount of carbon dioxide. Um, so we should be concerned about those guys, right? Um, so use of nitrogen fertilizers increases this nitrogen cycle. And so agricultural soils are the main source of nitric oxide from bacteria. There was an article that came out last year that there's good news. There's bacteria that are associated with the plant roots and grow with the plant um, and help them grow. Um, these researchers actually found that these bacteria can take nitric oxide and make nitrogen gas. So it could be a remediation or a mitigation method to get rid of nitrous oxide in the atmosphere. So we can use bacteria for our benefit. They're so metabolically diverse, you could probably find a bacteria that could do anything that you wanted it to do. Whoops, okay. And the last one with the nitrogen cycle is just the dead zones. Right, um, and so this occurs when agriculture runoff from fertilizer use enters the ocean, right? And what happens is stimulates algal growth during the spring and the summer, and then the algae die and they sink to the bottom, and then the bacteria consume them and they use all the oxygen left. So um, it makes sort of a, a anoxygenic, right? And so. This is just showing you um, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is the size of the dead zone over the um, 34 years that they've been measuring it. And you can see this year it wasn't that big, but they're saying this is because of Hurricane Hannah that um, churned everything up. Okay? And people call it a dead zone, but there's actually anaerobic chemolithotrophic bacteria living in this dead zone. Right, so researchers need to study um, these dead zones more because the, these bacteria can use nitrates and produce nitric oxide, which is a greenhouse gas. So by having dead zones, we might be actually producing more nitrous oxide um, than what was thought, right? So um, more study is definitely needed there. Okay, and so do I have a couple minutes, Matt, or should I end? Okay, so um, a number of other, so those are just general organisms, but we're all worried about disease organisms and causing disease. And so there's a study that shows that increasing temperature by 10 degrees increases the prevalence of antibiotic resistant bacteria you know, by slight amounts, but still increases. We get emergence of Vibrio infections in the Baltic Sea and warmer where we normally wouldn't find them. So bacterial and um, infections are gonna be able to spread. Vector range will increase. So um, 
The Davies aegypti, which carries dengue fever, Zika, et cetera, can spread into areas where it normally wouldn't um, survive, certainly tick-borne diseases. And then on the next slide at the end, I have an interesting thing here about fungi and this emerging fungal pathogen, which is a global health threat in, in hospitals. But um, fungi is fungi are predicted to adapt to warmer climates, we're going to see more fungus infections, which is not a good thing. Okay, so this podcast right here um, is very interesting about human evolution, their resistance to fungal infections, and the rise of fungal infections. So mammals and their body temperature, I don't have time to explain it, but it's a really interesting podcast, right? These are some more articles about bacteria and global warming. And then if you really like the art, here's a couple links for auger art so you can explore more auger art. Okay, I thank you. And I guess I'm turning it over to Steph. Yes, thank you, Cynthia. We'll have more, we'll have to have you speak a little bit more at the end about your auger art because there was a, a, some questions about that. So okay. be prepared for that. And I do want to say that I think that might be the first time in an art presentation we've had the word Chemio lithio autotrophs. Right. <laughs> it's the but, work for the day. There you go. But maybe not the last. Okay. All right, Steph, are you are you ready? Can you take it over? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. So my name is Stefan Halick, and I'm delighted to be here today and really thrilled with the challenge of being an artist and a docent and being said, okay, we're doing this thing with microbiology. And the first thing I did was I went and I, dived, I Googled microbiology and art and found this whole thing about people doing microbiology, micro biological art back in the 1930s. And then I mentioned this to Cynthia and she tells me that she's been doing it. What I'm going to do now is take us through three works of art in the Rising Tides exhibit. Now, when people go to an art museum, they generally spend about six seconds, sometimes up to 15 seconds in front of a piece of art, with three, three pieces of art. We're gonna spend about a minute or two in front of each one. I will describe why I have chosen this particular piece to look at. And then, uh, Matt, should I open it up for conversation in between each piece or should I wait till the end? What is your suggestion? Let's wait till the end. We'll okay. get, um, go through all of them and then we'll see what the confluence of all okay. of these things have percolated within our, okay. our audience. Okay. So I'm now going to go to my first piece, which is Surging by Pat Martin. I'm going to invite you to look at this for one minute in silence. Martin writes that this piece connects her to the experience of the ocean when she was a child. The image reminded her of the disorientation she experienced when she was tossed underwater by the waves in the, on the beach. I'd like to suggest that in the conversation that we have just had with Cynthia, this piece challenges us to look at the disorientation we begin to experience as we consider climate change and pollution and the very complex question of what is happening to the microorganisms on the planet. So close your eyes for five seconds or look at something different. Just look at something different. Be in the conversation that Cynthia has just been sharing with us 
the knowledge that this piece is about disorientation. Now come back, open your eyes, and look at the piece. Notice what you notice or see anew and see how it might add to your experience of the conversation of microbiology and climate change and art. If you want to, so you don't forget, you can type down in the chat just a message to everybody and we'll come back to that in a few moments. I'm going to move to my next piece in a moment. My next piece is a sculpture. It is called Daughter Cells and it is by Margarita Hagen, who I'm delighted to see has joined us today. Welcome, Margarita. Um, I have taken four photographs of this piece because it is not a painting on the wall. It's a sculpture. What I'm going to do is I'm going, I have four slides of this piece. I'm going to take us around the whole piece for 30 seconds for each side. Allow your imagination to create any connections that you see with the lecture that Cynthia has just given us and with the piece called Surging. And when we're done, we'll open up the platform and talk about the connections we see. So here we go. I invite you to look at this in silence and be with the piece. A daughter cell is the product of a single cell organism splitting into two via binary fusion or asexual reproduction. Hagen was inspired by single cells organisms that are some of the earliest plants life forms. I chose this because it is so fragile. It is a piece of porcelain. If I were to pick it up I could drop it and my imagination is that it would go all over the floor. However, if I were in the ocean and I stepped on it and it were alive, I'm a six foot two human being. I think I would pull my foot up out of the water and go as quickly in another direction. It's like stepping on a crustacean or um, just stepping on something. I chose it because it tells us, for me, how fragile yet tenacious this thing called creation is 
that we live in. Look at its spiky interior, exterior, interior. It's an exquisite piece. I invite you, if you have any, want to give yourself any reminders as we look at this, put it in chat so we can talk about it in a few moments. And then the final piece I have chosen is Emily Brown's Water for Eliza. I invite you to take a minute just being with this painting and looking at it in silence. This is a large charcoal and ink piece. And we're invited to look at the changing light and texture of the natural world, in this case, the water. I spend two hours every morning meditating over at Peace Valley. And this could be the lake at Peace Valley, or it could be uh, the Delaware water, or it could even be a puddle in the backyard. I chose this again because water is beautiful to look at until there is too much of it. And we have to deal with the flooding or the downed trees due to a saturated ground. So what I find as I look at the art um, and in the Rising Tides exhibit, and as I listen to Cynthia, who has a completely different background from me, the truth is we are all connected. And that's why we need each other. We are all connected, and I truly believe that is the message that Cynthia brings to us and the message that the artist brings to us. Thank you so much for your time, and Matt, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Steph. Wow, I think that was uh, the perfect way to connect these two um, presentations. This exhibition, uh, which, Again, if you haven't had a chance to go see it, I would highly uh, encourage you all to do so um, when you can. Uh, there were a lot of really great comments during that portion. Um, one comment from uh, Leslie Richardson. Leslie, are you here? Would you wanna, do you wanna speak to your comment by unmuting yourself? I'm here, Matt. Oh, great, great. Can you, can you tell us what you were, what you were thinking with that comment? Um, when I looked at that Pat Martin piece, I just felt a sense of being overwhelmed and not being able to do anything to affect it, to stop it, to change it. Um, and that's kind of the way I feel about global warming. You know, I do my little things, I recycle, I reuse, I buy you know, soap that's not in plastic. And <laughs> I do all those things that I can. I don't use plastic bags. I don't use plastic water bottles. But plastic is a part of our life. And I don't know how to make a difference. I feel like we do a ton of talking about it. But I don't know how to change it. And that's what that art did for me was just the inevitability and the overwhelmingness, if you will, of this really horrible situation. Thank you for, for sharing that connection, Leslie. I think that's a really um, pertinent and very personal one that you've shared. While you say that, it makes me um, want to ask uh, Cynthia, um, I mean, you, this is a question that I think is related to that and it's something that we've talked about before. Like you work with things that you can't like are so small that you can't see, 
but have huge impacts on our world. And it's the same sort of um, uh, dynamic that Leslie just brought up. What are some things from uh, a microbiology perspective uh, that we can do right now? That like these, these issues that you outlined, is there things that we can do on our own to help uh, the effects of, um, on a, on a micro scale? Is there things that we can do? Oh, wait. Hold on, Cynthia. One second. Oh, S Cynthia. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, there's something wrong with your... No. Here's Cynthia, let's try to leave and come back, okay? I'll let you back in or fix your, um, your microphone there, great. Um, another point that we had here. Okay, um, better? Can you oh yeah, me? perfect, there All you right, go. Great. Okay, so what was, the question was, what can we do from a microorganism point of view? Yeah. Um, well, the, you know, hate to say this, but you could probably eat less red meat, right? The farmers will get all mad at me. <laughs> but cows are ruminant animals. So sheep also, right, are, are um, there's, I forget what the statistic is, but in New Zealand, there's more sheep than people and they produce more greenhouse gas by the <laughs> methane than the people living in New Zealand by human activity. So, um, yeah, not eating so much meat, right? And um, encouraging plant, you know, it, it's a catch-22, um, using natural fertilizers in your garden instead of buying miracle Grow, right? Which increases, you know, nitric oxide production. Um, I'm not sure, you know, it's gonna take a whole society to change the way they do things, right? Yeah. So, and like I said, there's not a whole lot known, so we don't really know what remedies there could be, right? Yeah. So another another pers perspective we had here. Um, it looks like Margarita. Mar is a, she wants to ask a question, but Margarita, you need to unmute yourself. I know. I know. There I there she is. Thank you so much, both of you. Matt, thank you. This is really, I couldn't, when I saw this was on the Missioner website, I'd like to sign up immediately. So I've been waiting for this. We're, we're all in this together. And um, there, I hear the, the overwhelming feeling. I love that piece by Pat so much. And I love that it's next to daughter cells because they feel like they're talking to each other. Um, but there are, it's overwhelming, but there's a lot of things we can do, you guys. And um, there's an incredible film that has just come out. It's on Netflix and it's called Kiss the Ground. I highly recommend everybody to watch it and tell everybody you know to watch it. Um, Kristen Olson wrote a beautiful book, an important book called The Edit. I read it many times and she's in the film. A lot of what's in this film, it is so uplifting and inspiring, but it addresses agriculture is like our greatest um, offense uh, to climate. But um, it's really gonna be helpful for us to see the simple ways that we can make amazing differences. Keep doing all the recycling that you're doing. Those of you that, that have been, but um, we're in a new time and I feel like the uh, COVID and our pandemic has been an incredible and important global wake up call. And, um, and we're here to reset so that we can really restore and, and move forward with the thriving, thriving lives for all communities and all environments. But um, a lot of work on my wall and in the installation interdependent, Cynthia, it is um, our microorganisms, the primary producers of the sea. So it would be so fun to, to meet you there. But um, thank you all for today, everybody that contributed and, and brilliant work. But that film, 
and, and on my website, I have a page called eSources. It has a list of a lot of ways that we can do little things to make a difference and feel good. Mostly we have to take care of ourselves, self-care, and then we can help each other and, and everything will, will move in a better direction. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Margarita. I really appreciate you uh, coming today and sharing those, those words and thoughts. It's an extra special treat for everyone, thank for you. everyone here. Uh, before we move on, I would like, Cynthia, if you could uh, give us a little bit more information on the auger art that you showed during your um, presentation. How do you make it? What types of bacteria do you use? How do you get the different colors? So, so auger, right, is an extract of seaweed and you can use it for, in foods and, and things like that. So um, bacteria, these bacteria have nutritional requirements like us. So you can use something like chicken broth or beef broth, put auger in it, solidify it, and put it into a Petri dish and you have um, a place to grow bacteria, right? And like you said, bacteria are very small. So we need to grow, let them grow. And then when they grow and multiply, they make a colony. So we can see them visually. That colony is millions of cells growing all together as one group. Now, different bacteria will produce different pigments depending on you know, who they are and, and where they live. And some pigments are involved in photosynthesis. Some are sort of other antimicrobial some substances or antifungal substances so they, somebody doesn't eat them um, if they live in the soil. And so the soil is a big place of germ warfare, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so what we do is the students, um, I study plant growth promoting bacteria. So the students will get the bacteria from plant uh, roots. And those are just some of the isolates that we got that produce pigments that we could use for the art, right? Um, the purple one, I think, actually came from Lake Archer, right? That's a chromobacterium. Um, the pink one is Serratia marcescens. The, the yellow ones and the green ones are micrococcus, which actually came from someone's skin. Um, and maybe micrococcus roseus, right? These are back normal inhabitants of your skin. They're not detrimental. Um, the white ones are bacillus and they grow, they can grow filamentously and fanning out and things like that. Um, and so I'd have to look at the, ex and, and some of them might be ones that were never really isolated or uh, identified right correctly or to this ex some extent right um, uh, just different isolates from these bacteria so um you know serratia marcescens the red one through history um before people knew it was bacteria would be able to grow and certain think people think that statues would be bleeding Right? They thought it was a miracle, but it turns out it was just Serratia marcescens growing a big colony dripping down. So, right? What? And you do this with students, right? I do this with students, right? What's their, what's their reaction? Do they, do they have fun with it? Do they, um, yeah, what they do? well, I would say in the class, I don't make it optional, and I have about anywhere from 60 to 70 students a semester. And I would say half of them will do an auger art project, right? And we have a little competition and then they all vote who has the nicest project, right? The reindeer <laughs> is one that I remember won first place one year, right? So <laughs> That's great. Um, and we'll be sure to share those links that you sent um, in your presentation later. Right, so the, the ASM, American Society of Microbiology, has an auger art contest where there are some serious artwork in there. So someone did Starry Night using bacteria. Um, yeah, there's way beyond the scope of what I'm able to do artistically, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at the ASM website. And Alexander Fleming, you were talking about 1930s, Alexander Fleming that um, discovered penicillin Someone complained about him one time that he spends more time doing his auger art than he spends doing his research. <laughs> That's great. Now, Steph, I want to go. I want to go back to to you because I know you you talked about um, this presentation. Sorry for the 
dirt bikes there. The, uh, and you thought really closely about these different artworks. When you were doing that meditation with us today, what were some of the things you were thinking about for the Pat Martin or Margarita's, um, Margarita's work? Well, Matt, the whole thing that is so important to me, and this is, and this is my own bias as an artist, okay? Mm -hmm. If art is not connected to the human experience, I don't think it's art. I believe that the purpose of art, be it political, be it beauty, be it whatever, is for telling us about our human experience. And so often what we do is we walk into a museum and people look at something and they go, they walk away from the museum going, oh, well, that was a fun thing to do, but they haven't really connected with the art, which is why I invite people, and the museum does through the Art of Stillness program, to spend time with a piece of art. So when you invited me to be a part of this, I, just like I do, oh, sure, Matt, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then I hang up going, what in God's name have I gotten myself into? And so I walked over to the museum. I don't know anything about microbiology. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Except that it's there. And I walk in and I look at uh, the first piece, the surge, um, or surging. And it was like, oh, it connected me immediately to the experience of, A, I'm overwhelmed. And I know from a child being in the water what it means to get tumbled about. From surging, and thank you, Margarita, for pointing out that it's right next to daughter cells, I go over to daughter cells. And I'm sitting there looking at daughter cells going, what is this about? And then what comes up is the past from, A, stepping on a, a, um, a career, um, a Ukraine, what are they called? An urchin, stepping on one, and then also eating one. <laughs> um, eating it, it was fabulous. Stepping on it was not so good. And that's when it began to all emerge to me as I'm going through the whole exhibit, which I invite everybody to do, everybody. And don't miss Margarita's installation. I was drawn to tears. All of a sudden, the whales are singing in this thing. Um, so for me, the whole thing became about our connection. And what you need to know, folks, is this morning I changed the name of my presentation. Originally, it was going to be the microbiology of art, an exploration of what holds art together. It's not what, it's both and. And what it is that Cynthia contributed to me and then what I was able to contribute back to all of you. So does that make any sense? I'm an artist, I don't know. Does it make sense? <laughs> no, it makes perfect sense. And I will, and uh, Steph and Cynthia are such good sports for this program because we really, you know, the idea was to have, um, you know, the information from Cynthia and other DelVal professors, and then find a way to connect it to this amazing exhibition because yeah. just like, uh, we're talking about, you know, this information is so important for us and for our future. Uh, and we, I believe, and I know we've talked about this stuff, is that, you know, we need artists and people to help us understand this information better. So this program is really aimed at connecting this really important information um, to people and to the, the artwork that sort of expresses and connects us. So thank you, Steph. And thank you, thank Cynthia, you. for being such good sports on this uh, first trial run here. I think it was a... Um, it was really interesting to see all of these connections. Uh, I'm going to go look at uh, bacteria in a way that I've never seen before. Um, and I think it was a, a really sp uh, a special time uh, for us to get this insight into the work and insight into these really important scientific information. Um, before we end, uh, I just put in the chat here, we have three more of these Del Val professor and uh, docent talks coming up later in the fall. Please sign up for those. We have other Rising Tides programs in connection, which will all go into these detail, into these topics and ideas uh, more in depth. So please uh, sign up for those. Lastly, I wanted to turn it over to Cynthia or Steph, if you had any other final thoughts for our, for our viewers here. Um, go ahead, Steph. Thank you. 
There you um, go. Thanks for being part of the fun, part of being human. Um, Cynthia, it was a delight to meet you, and I'm never going to look at microbiology. Um, my husband is a pharmacist. I should know more about it, you know? <laughs> it's a whole new world, <laughs> so thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Steph. It was nice to meet you and Matt and everybody else. And I'll probably never look at art the same way again, right? <laughs> there we go. That's perfect. So next time I go to a museum, I'll certainly, I mean, sometimes when I go, there are pieces that make you sit and stare for a lot longer. But sometimes you do just walk by, by oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, and no. don't take care of your microbiome, take care of the bacteria. Don't forget about them. That's perfect. I think that's an excellent note to end on. Everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, until we see each other next time, please be safe, please be well, and stay arty, everyone. We'll see you later. Thank you. Bye.